I wish my general chemistry professor confided to me. I could encourage you to major in English instead of chemistry. The reluctance in her voice was evident and betrayed a tortured decision. On one hand, she wanted to encourage me for earning A's in both her lecture and laboratory courses over the past two semesters. But on the other hand, she knew that chemistry was a highly visual field demanding an intimate understanding of three-dimensional spatial relationships and the ability to interpret complex instrumental readouts. Shown here, for example, is a three-dimensional ball and stick representation of a molecule that all of you have probably taken at some point to alleviate a pain or to lower a fever. It's ibuprofen, the active ingredient of Motrin. And it actually exists as a pair of structures that differ from one another in the same way your right hand differs from your left. The left-handed form of the molecule, given this orientation, directs the oxygen atoms towards us, whereas the right-handed form directs those atoms away from us. That subtle structural difference in the spatial arrangement of atoms causes the left-handed form to be biologically active and the right-handed one to be inactive. But don't worry, half your bottle of Motrin isn't just filler. Your metabolism actually converts the right-handed into the left-handed form. To go beyond static structural representations, chemists also visualize molecular vibrations through their interaction with infrared light, as shown by this spectrum, where each dip corresponds to absorption by a particular vibration or molecular motion. So for example, the dip above 1600 wave numbers corresponds to stretching of the C double bond O shown at right. Perhaps because of the complexity of the molecular perspective, only one in a hundred students that pass through a general chemistry course, according to Donald McQuarrie's textbook, goes on to graduate in the subject. How much more likely, my professor wondered, would failure be for me as a legally blind student. The difficulties, it seen from her perspective, were conceptual and insurmountable. Something akin to imparting the idea of the color blue to a totally blind person. At the time, I was a political science major and enjoyed all the accommodations I needed to succeed including audio textbooks from the nonprofit organization Learning Ally, a screen reader program for my computer, and a handheld braille computer for taking notes. So it may seem strange, but I chose to switch my major to a more visually demanding subject for which far fewer accommodations were available, and the professor could hardly imagine how I could learn the material. But that challenge of stepping beyond my comfort zone to test the limits of my abilities with the added prospect of proving her low expectations wrong was the fun part. A comfort zone is very much like the cushion on a chair. It's only soft to him who sits on it but seldom. After a while, when the cushion has gone flat and the chair is hard to sit in, it's all too easy to remain seated, blaming other people or predicaments beyond your control for your continued discomfort. It requires effort to assume the weight of responsibility to stand up and venture forward. In the words of the poet James Sivirs, it's not our faults that make us fail, or our talents that mean success. It's what we do with what we've got that separates one from the rest. And I was certainly willing to expend any amount of effort to reject as abhorrent 
the idea that circumstances should define or confine my aspirations. To reject the assumption, in my case, that impaired sight meant impaired insight, particularly when it came to chemistry. Chemistry, as a discipline that seeks to understand and utilize nature's molecular language, attracted my curiosity, my desire to understand the secret motions and causes of things, to use Sir Francis Bacon's phrase, and I rapidly bonded with the subject matter. Instead of seeing chemistry as a collection of complicated structures and spectra that I could not see, I learned early on that the subject was actually a way to transcend physical blindness. One morning, standing outside the chemistry lecture room, I overheard two classmates bemoaning how difficult the subject was to learn. It's not like we can see atoms, one of them complained, to which I replied, white cane in hand, neither can I. Within my response was the realization that chemistry is the study of reality at a resolution beyond all our senses. The development of the discipline has been the elaboration of images for a reality to which even the sighted are visually blind. The images are products of a chemical imagination that interpolates between experimental observables. So, for example, we know that atoms come together and form bonds to give a molecule a particular shape without ever having seen a particular molecule. We determine the geometry of a molecule, for example, by placing it in a magnetic field, signing radio waves, and obtaining a spectrum like this in a technique that is very similar to magnetic resonance imaging in healthcare. From the spectrum, which has characteristic signals, we can deduce in this case that the molecule is ibuprofen. Similarly, we tell stories about how chemicals come together, interact, and react to form new compounds without ever watching the dance of atoms in between. We deduce the stories from clues about the intervening process. These pictorial representations of chemical phenomena have become conventional because they're useful. But as human conventions, there's no reason why I could not invent other non-visual conventions that worked better for me as well as other blind people. And that is exactly what I did. But before I tell you how I learned chemistry as a blind person, I must tell you why I went to the trouble. Chemistry, for me, is a way to see farther than the eye can see into the nature of our universe. It is the language through which reality is expressed, from a heavenly star to an earthly stone, from a sage plant to a sagacious person. Everything in the physical universe has a chemical basis, even you. There is no such thing as chemical-free. The word chemical, in a very deep sense, is a synonym of existence. That is why it's said, you shouldn't take atoms too seriously. They make up everything. <laughs> there was a second reason why I was attracted to chemistry. But before I reveal it, if any of you are wondering, this spells out using molecules in the shapes of letters, Yukon chemistry. The second reason why I was attracted to chemistry is that we not only learn a language to read and acquire knowledge, but also to speak and create new knowledge. And it's through the language of chemistry that the bounds of the physically possible are continuously being expanded. I have found it an endlessly captivating thought that every medical and material improvement in human life has come from an increased fluency in speaking this language. The ability to arrange timeless atoms in new ways, 
to unleash the hidden potential of the universe in which we live. To give just one commonplace example, the acetyl salicylic acid, or aspirin, you may take for a headache today, hopefully not from this conference, is no more a chemical than salicin, the active ingredient in the bark of the willow tree that was prescribed over 2,000 years ago in ancient Greece for similar pain symptoms. But there's this difference. The salicin produced by the plant for its own good has been improved by chemists for our good. Aspirin is both more potent and less harsh on the stomach than salicin when taken either in a naturalistic fashion as the impure powdered wood bark or when isolated by chemical methods from the plant. Aspirin is a human creation that has never existed anywhere at any time in nature. Some may pejoratively call it artificial or synthetic for that reason. And yet, it is recognized by the same bodily enzyme that understood the message carried by the plant compound. Every chemical invented by us, whether it is a plastic, a pharmaceutical, or a pesticide, is just another word added to the chemical dictionary of the universe. Whether a human or a plant coins the molecular neologism, it's no more artificial than the word internet is to the English language. And like language, the appropriateness of a word often depends on context. The mustard gases, for example, invented for mass murder on the battlefields of World War I, became in low doses the first life-saving cancer chemotherapies. In order to converse in this chemical language of objective reality, to expand the bounds of the physically possible was and is why I am attracted to chemistry. But to learn the subject, I needed to figure out at the same time how to learn it as a blind person. That meant constantly inventing, testing, and refining ways of seeing the concepts. Classroom lectures, for example, resembled a classic vaudeville act in which an assistant beholding an object describes it in such a way that the blindfolded entertainer can positively identify it. As in this act, the professor verbally encoded visual chemical information in such a way that I could, hopefully, form a mental picture and record the information in my notes. So just to give a flavor of this, the trigonal planar geometry of Borain, BH3, was described with reference to the face of an analog clock. With the boron atom in the middle, the BH bonds extend like the hands of the clock to the 12, 6, and 8 o'clock positions. Similarly, I listened for many hours to an audio textbook on which the figures were meticulously described and built models of molecules based on those descriptions. Playing with the model kit allowed me to map out, first in space and then in my mind, the shapes of molecules. So that today, when I hear the name of a chemical, I first picture the structure in all its three-dimensional splendor. That experience years later allowed me to imagine twisting a molecule with my hands. And that insight led directly to a research discovery published in the highest journal of the, of the American Chemical Society. With all this literally hands-on training, my general chemistry course was, in essence, a two-semester experiment to test the hypothesis of whether sight, physical sight, was needed to learn chemistry. And at the end of that experiment, my professor pronounced her verdict. I wish I could encourage you to major in English instead of chemistry. But with a pause, she added, I can't. The problem is you're too darn good at it. 
just over a decade later, having published more than 10 peer-reviewed articles, cited over 45 times, and having received my doctorate in chemistry this past spring with Dr. Jose Gascon of the Yukon Chemistry Department as my advisor, I warmly remember my general chemistry professor's words. Though I did not take her initial advice to major in English, I would like to leave you with a poem on the theme of crossing the comfort zone, or what is the same, venturing blindly forward to realize new possibilities. I don't know I can't succeed unless I'm forced to concede, but not even then, because I can always try again. So as you can see, every success has its fee to be as resilient as can be. Thank you.